Welcome to Somerville Livewire. I'm Mary Ellen Muir. Massachusetts has the eighth highest rate of overdose mortality in the country. And in 2018, the number of Somervillians dying from overdoses was five times more than, in, than it was in 2012. The city of Somerville created a study team to look into establishing a safe consumption site, an SCS. That's where individuals can bring their own drugs to use under the supervision of healthcare professionals or trained staff. And the teams recommended that Somerville establish a site in Davis Square and or East Somerville. So what do you think? The task force survey results showed that the majority of Somervillians support this, as did my little mini, very unscientific polls that I posted on social media. But in the comments, there were many other concerns that people were raising. Will people actually go to the sites? Will they encourage additional drug use? Will more people be using drugs? Will the sites attract people from other parts of the city? In other words, will this become a mecca for drug users throughout the greater Boston area? It's an emotional issue. Many comments were from people who have personal experience with loved ones or family members that have been um, involved with this very difficult issue. And to learn more, I had a chance to speak to two people on the task force. The first is TJ Thompson and the other is Dr. Miriam Harris. TJ is an organizer at the Material Aid and Advocacy Program in Cambridge and is a peer research associate on the study team. TJ, thanks for joining us. Could you tell us a little bit about the, the study team and how you came to be um, involved with it? Yeah, yeah, again, um, basically, if you wanna go back a couple of years, Joe Curtitoni, the mayor of Somerville, announced um, in 2019 that he would be opening um, a safe consumption site or supervised consumption site um, in the city of Somerville in December, 2020. He made the announcement. So from there, um, there, was, there was a bit of a scramble, um, but a task force was put together in the city of Somerville by um, Doug Kress, who is the Health and Human Services Director in Somerville. And this was, um, this was comprised of people with lived experience, advocates, doctors, lawyers, nurses, EMTs, firefighters, politicians, you know, a gamut of people that had stake um, in something like this happening. So we had this group of about 30 people and they began meeting. Um, and what uh, the city of Somerville did was they put forth, forth a grant of $12,000 um, to Dr. Alexander Collins and Dr. Brandon Marshall to head up uh, this task force. Um, this, um, they took over in about October, 2020. Um, to lead the task force to see what would happen to, what it would take to open um, an SCS in um, the city of Somerville. And to, at the end of this um, pro project, um, come out with a um, needs and feasibility assessment report for the city of Somerville. So the task force started to meet and almost immediately we had a pandemic, if we all remember. Um, so <laughs> it, it hit a brick wall almost immediately. So it, it, yeah. it, we knew, almost right off the bat that it was not gonna be open in December of 2020. Um, but we decided to keep meeting anyway. We were all learning how to use Zoom. We decided to just forge ahead and see how this would go. Tell us a little bit about how is it that you became involved with this issue anyway? What is it um, in your life that brought you to um, focus on safe consumption sites? Well, in my life, um, about 10 years ago, um, I was using I was using drugs. I was using IV drugs, and I um, at the time I was in Berkeley, California, and I sustained an injury on my arm. For God knows what, I was in a bathroom. It was not a clean environment. It was not a safe situation. I had nowhere else to go, and I I ducked into a bathroom, and I used, and I, my arm became infected. I thought I could take care of it. I, I, I tried to keep it clean. I tried to do everything I could to thwart um, a further infection and it grew and it grew. Um, eventually I had, I had to go to the hospital. I, um, my arm was so large. I, I couldn't deny it anymore. I couldn't have to deny that I needed help. And when I went in there almost immediately, a doctor looked at me and told me that they were gonna have to amputate my arm, which it was a very, very painful thing to hear. It was very terrifying. Terrifying, yes. terrifying for anybody. Anybody, um, yes. 
Yeah, and I'm a musician. I need my arms. Um, it, I, I thought my, I thought my life was over. I thought, yeah. I thought it didn't matter if I died. I, yeah. it, it wouldn't matter. It would not matter to me at all. Um, I begged them. I don't know how much to help. But basically, they looked into it further. I went into an immediate operation. I had two operations in the next two days. Um, they were able to save my arm. They're both here. I'm very <laughs> thankful for that. I have a very, very, um, very gnarly scar on my arm now. That's one of the first things people see when they see me, which is fine. It's not a great story that I like to tell, but it's a story that has led me into being an advocate for having a supervised consumption site open because the more I learned about them and I learned all the benefits that it can bring to people. And if I, at the time, had I known about them, had I known that that was an option, if that was an option available to me where I was at that time, I definitely, instead of ducking into a dirty, dirty bathroom, I would have, I would have walked into a supervised consumption site. I would have used there and chances are I wouldn't have had the infection or if I did get an infection, it'd be somewhere there to teach me about proper wound cleaning. And I wouldn't have gone through that ordeal, but I look at this now, I mean, it led me to a place where now I know that they exist. Now I can fight for them. So one of the, one of the questions that people have about it is would people actually go to a safe consumption site? Um, and you're saying that you would have, and I guess the question is, you know, there's this idea that addicts are, are just completely incapacitated and not really capable of going, that they're going to, you know, they're going to shoot up wherever they get the, um, the drugs. So, you know, you're saying that you would go, could you address that? Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. First off, I'm going to say people who use drugs, not addicts, if we don't mind. Sure. Okay? Yep. Um, people who use drugs, um, they are all across the board of what mindset they may or may not be in. Um, there are people all around us that use drugs every day that you possibly don't know, don't notice. There are people that you see, walk, that you walk by that maybe you do know. Um, every single person has a different story. Every single person who uses drugs has a different story and a different level at which they are possibly functioning at any given point in time. And this is, you know, due to whatever substance they may be on. This may be due to mental health issues. This may be due to poverty. This may be due to a myriad of things. Um, so the thing is, if one is open and, one, and people, if people do know that they're open and they're available and they do have any kind of knowledge of what, what goes on inside of them, most people are likely to use them. And I I do know this because I because being um, part of um, the task force, I talked to a lot of people. I talked to, I did a lot of these interviews that were used in the, um, in the, the, in the research. A lot of the, um, I did these interviews. I, I took down these answers, but at the material and advocacy, advocacy program, like every day I talk to people, every day I talk to people that um, all sorts of distance, different situations. Sometimes I find out people I've been using drugs the entire time I've known them and I had no idea. So really it's, um, as I talk to people, the more you bring it up, people are like, yeah, yeah, I would use that. Yeah. That seems like a really good idea. I would go there because people are in a situation now where they're, they are once like like that, like I said, going to a bathroom. But there are also people, as you talk about, um, like a pub, like the public health concern. There are people that have gone behind dumpsters or in alleyways, um, or just or are out, out in public, you know, shooting up because they don't have another place to go, and so they do that. So you, if you present somebody with an option of a clean, safe environment without stigma that they can go to. Um, a lot of people are willing to do that. A lot of folks are really willing to do that. So, and and so you've there are a couple of points here. Number one is 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 not everyone is you know completely out of it the way it was described in some of these online comments that a lot of these people are walking around and you're you're interacting with them and you don't necessarily know that these people are using um, using drugs. And then um, you have um, the other issue, which is just, they may be in really terrible shape, but they would go to um, this type of facility. So then, so then the other side of it is people will travel. And so one of the concerns is that this would actually attract uh, people using drugs from other areas of Boston because Somerville would be the only community that has it in the um, in the Boston area or in the state, actually. I think I think Rhode Island started one, so Somerville wouldn't be the first. Um, but even so, so tell me a little bit about that. I mean, do you think that people would, you know, would travel from outside Somerville to, um, you know, to come to, to, to the center to use it? 
Okay, first off, I just want to say Rhode Island um, passed uh, legislation to open a pilot, um, to start a pilot program. Um, but yes, um, some people would travel a little bit. Most people on um, the research shows, um, first off, research from Canada and Australia and other countries, because let me remind you, there are um, 11 countries running supervised consumption sites right now uh, with 120 different sites. Um, most of these places, um, people don't tend to tra travel more than one mile to go to them. Um, and you did bring up that, you know, Somerville would be the only one in Massachusetts. And that is, um, that is one of the things we did discuss at the task force. Um, mm -hmm. And one of the things first off that we had to discuss was that right now Somerville is severely lacking in any kind of um, harm reduction, um, um, like no, they have no drop-in facilities. Um, the needle exchange program that is used at Somerville is traveling from Cambridge. Um, so with um, this is already an, um, a need that Somerville needs to address in the first place is having something available, whether or not be a supervised consumption site, they need to have some kind of programs that need to be brought to the area already. This is already a problem that has been identified. Um, so we don't really, we don't foresee like this influx of people coming in because not only has um, not only what did the survey that we put out, um, nobody wanted to travel for more than 10, 20 minutes to go wherever they're going. Um, like they all thought it was a great idea, but that they're not going to come in from they're not going to come in from like you know Revere or Boston. Really, um, you have the people in the media area, and we already have um, you know having um, a needle exchange program in Cambridge. We already know that how. It's, it's not this like honeypot effect of people coming in from all over the place. It is a very concentrated group of people that are already there. And a lot of people from Somerville are already traveling to Cambridge. To Cambridge, so okay. we have this back, like there's a back and forth right now and there happens to be more services in Cambridge. So you see people from Somerville coming there, but this is not going to necessarily send people back to Somerville or send more people to Somerville. It's going to open another accessible site for people who use to um, access clean equipment and possibly um, a better experience than what they are than what is available right now. So in other words, you have data from our local area from Camberville that says what happens when you offer services for people who who need them so you know so in other words to address one of the other issues that came up which is well the people selling the drugs are then going to come up because this is where their market is you know so so you know again it's the concern about the convergence of um activity that is localized on that area did you see any of that in cambridge at the needle exchange I can't speak to what the difference between before the needle exchange was there and after. I mean, this was, I mean, this is going back, I, I don't know, I, I think 20 years when they opened the needle exchange up in Cambridge. I, and then drop in maybe, I can't be sure, but it's, it's been a while. Um, yeah. So I don't know what the statistics are specifically in Cambridge from before and after, but this, the statistics um, from Canada and from Australia, especially, um, when these kind of sites have opened up, when a safe consumption, supervised consumption site has opened up, um, there is not a significant increase or decrease really in um, arrests for drug dealing, possession, um, charges of, of assault, robbery. None of this goes up statistically in different countries that we do have um, data um, evidence going back years. So we do know that from other countries opening supervised consumption sites. It does not increase. If anything, it's been a slight decrease in many of those areas, drug dealing in, um, included. Yeah, I did read some results from what happened up in Vancouver, up in Canada, and the police actually reported that crime did decrease a little bit. So I'm sure that's um, some of the data that you're looking at. So again, you know, just uh, again, logistically, I mean, and obviously you've talked about many, many issues that I'm not even thinking about, or we don't have time to talk about all of them. But what about the fact that the, the, the drugs are still illegal? So are the police, you know, what, how does this work then? You know, can somebody still be arrested for possession um, until they walk into the site? I mean, how does that work? Um, that is going to very specifically come down to how um, the police and, um, well, and, and the mayor of Somerville, who that may be at the time, now that we have, you know, we'll have a new mayor coming in Somerville. So it's, um, we had um, kind of an answer before. Um, they will have to work that out. Part of the um, needs and assessment report um, laid down um, recommendations for how the police um, should deal with um, enforcement around the area um, with recommendations as to, you know, directing people to the area, directing and 
um, or directing people towards um, um, not not arresting people and not trying to target the area. Um, that is definitely that would have to be um, a city by city, um, case by case. Um, decision. Um, so there is a recommendation laid out for Somerville. We did have p- police officers represented on the task force um, involved um, with the recommendations going forward in the city in that report. In the end, um, a supervised consumption site is, it's a it's a public health issue, not a criminal issue. And it's not an issue of, you know, crime. This is public health and this is saving lives. So this is what we are trying to do. Thank you very much. I think on that note, that's the very, very best place to end this conversation. Thank you for your work. It's such a critically important issue. Um, lots of lots of people who are ramping up on their knowledge about it, but I just want to thank you for taking your taking the time to share your knowledge and your experience about this. Of course. Thank you. Another person who is helping Somerville with the decision to an implementation of um, safe injection sites or um, supervised consumption sites here in Somerville is Dr. Miriam Harris. Dr. Harris is um, an addiction and primary care doctor um, at the Boston Medical Center and is also assistant professor and clinician and investigator in addiction science. Um, Dr. Harris is also part of the task force in Somerville helping to explore all of these issues. Dr. Harris, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. I'm wondering if you could start by um, giving us a little bit of information and background on how it is that you came to um, be part of this initiative in Somerville. Um, Yeah, it dates back to uh, when I first sort of moved to Boston, which was uh, two and a half years ago now. I joined um, a advocacy group known as SIFMA Now, or Safe Injection Facilities Massachusetts Now. Uh, which is a group focused on establishing safe consumption sites uh, here in Massachusetts. And through sort of relationships in that group, um, I came to hear about the Somerville Task Force in action, actually predating the task force establishment. And I think I was invited initially to come to one of the early meetings to speak about experiences I had as a physician and trainee in Canada, uh, working either in or alongside safe consumption spaces uh, during my training and practice there. Okay, and I wonder, that's um, really great that you have that experience because obviously those of us in the United States don't have it because we haven't had any of these sites. I'm wondering, could you tell us your experiences? You know, where do they have safe consumption sites? What's been your role? And then, you know, what is, how has it gone? Um, There are now (laughs) consumption sites uh, across Canada. Uh, The first site was established Um, over two decades now uh, in uh, Vancouver, British Columbia. Um, But uh, with time, um, they have expanded across the country. Um, And I have toured or worked in or worked alongside sites in Vancouver, Ontario in Ottawa and Quebec in Montreal. So give us a picture, paint a picture of what a safe consumption site in Somerville might look like, Um, because as you say, you have a range um, that are in Canada. What would be a comparable um, facility that we might have in Somerville? I mean, just kind of when you when you're standing outside the door, what do you see? And when you walk in, what do you see? So I think that the first thing that needs to be done when you're thinking about establishing a site is sort of engaging with the community and uh, establishing what the community needs. And then the site really reflects those needs. And that work's been done um, by some researchers at Brown in um, collaboration with the Somerville community. And what um, sort of the broad strokes of the findings were, was that folks are looking for a safe consumption place that includes uh, a place to inject, a place to also use substances, for example, by smoking, Um, maybe a place to spend some time if you were using methamphetamine, 
which of course is a very different experience than using opioids and therefore would maybe need some different rooms or facilities to reflect that experience. And also people were very interested in wraparound services. So sites can either sort of be standalone uh, safe consumption spaces or be embedded in sort of a larger integrated care model with other health services um, adjacent or directly in the safe consumption space. For example, uh, uh, social services like connecting with a social worker or a housing expert to help establish a pathway to become uh, housed. Um, or um, sexual violence services, uh, sexual health services, which includes sort of hepatitis C, HIV, and STI testing, and um, post-incarceral services. So there are sort of a range of services that could be affiliated or adjacent or within the safe consumption space. And that was identified as a need um, by the Somerville residents, um, probably reflecting that there are still many barriers to accessing these services um, in more traditional healthcare or health delivery settings. I mean, some of the things that people have a hard time getting their minds around is the, you know, for people who are not familiar with these issues as you are, um, isn't this going to encourage drug use? Isn't this going to bring dealers to Davis Square or to East Somerville or wherever the site is located? Isn't this gonna bring, you know, um, drug activity to, to that location? And, you know, I mean, I know the studies say that, you, that it has to be close and not that many people are going to come, but, but the fundamental question is that the drugs are still illegal. And it is still Ill, you know, illegal activity. So I guess I just wanted to ask you, is, is, is the solution to um, decriminalize or legalize these drugs so that people don't have to worry about the police chasing them until they step foot into the <laughs> consumption site? I mean, how does that work? And from your medical point of view, what is the solution? So I think those are two different questions um, there, and with two sort of big and, and complex answers. To your first question about will a safe consumption space encourage drug use? Um, the, the answer is really definitively no. Um, and, and, and that's been sort of very well studied and documented. Um, the sort of honeypot effect is, has been uh, a big fear, um, not only here in the United States, but in Canada too. So maybe if you could address the, you know, the, the, the broader issue of the fact that the drugs are actually illegal and, you know, how much would change if we just went ahead and, and legalized them and made this truly a public health issue and a, a, a medical maintenance issue as opposed to, um, you know, kind of this, this um, bandage approach that we're trying to take here? Yeah, I think that is the root of the problem, the war on drugs. And safe consumption spaces are a, a innovative and evidence-based tool to address that sort of root cause problem, but it, it won't remove it. And I, I think you are totally correct at sort of looking at the broader issue. Um, and uh, there is... Uh, less evidence or like uh, published evidence on legalization. Um, there is uh, lots of published evidence on decriminalization, mostly from Portugal, because they moved to enact decriminalization, basically for the exact same reasons that we're talking about this here in the United States and in Canada. We're, they were too having a crisis related to drug overdose and substance use and addiction. And um, the health system looked at sort of the root causes and identified the war on drugs as one of them and moved to decriminalize. And the results have been incredibly compelling. Overdose deaths decreased by 50%. Um, it has helped people move into treatment much more effectively. It has decreased the number of people in the criminal legal system using those time and resources, uh, both in carceral facilities, but just with parole officers. Um, it has reduced uh, 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 burdens on the police force. And so I absolutely agree that decriminalization is where we should be heading. Um, 
and uh, working on establishing a safe consumption space and decriminalization should be happening in tandem. Um, but we can't wait for one or the other. To what extent do you believe that if somebody has, you know, can get the drugs in a dose that works for them, it's supervised and so forth, is it possible for people to live productive lives under this scenario? Or is it really still kind of dire for these people? Well, I think it, it depends on where someone is at. There are lots of people out there right now who have full and complete lives who use drugs, illegal drugs. Um, anyone who develops an addiction to a substance, for example, alcohol, the most problematic addiction, which is a legal drug, um, can have devastating consequences to their health and social well-being because they've lost control over that substance use. That is true for all substances. And that's my perspective as a, a primary care provider and addiction physician. Um, that perspective may be different and changing as we learn more about the science or if you ask a person who uses drugs. But as a person who cares for this population, um, and I think alcohol is a really good example because there's way less stigma and judgment around that substance because it is legal. But I, I watch people die from their alcohol consumption. And um, that is problematic. I think where safe consumption spaces come in is that whether someone is um, very, uh, is, is have experiencing severe addiction or whether they're not and just using recreationally um, on more control of their substance use, it provides a space to meet them where they're at and keep them alive and offer hope and um, a space of, you know, uh, no stigma and, and love and caring and, and also of um, respect, which a lot of our spaces in our healthcare system are lacking for people who use drugs. Well, it sounds like a gateway to better life as opposed to a gateway to, to, to the decline. So um, I just, uh, we're out of time. So I want to thank you very much um, for your time and sharing your ex expertise. And obviously there will continue to be many questions from the community going forward. Um, but um, thank you for um, helping us get a better understanding of um, this initiative for Somerville. Thank you so much for having me. And that's it for today's show. We'll see you in two weeks on Somerville Livewire.